Because one theologian has says that the, the cross of, of Christ, it's, it's like a diamond, you know, and, and you can appreciate it the, the more angles that you look at it from. And, and every, every angle is, is beautiful and wonderful and precious. And so we're going to be looking at a few angles that Mark brings to our attention, but not all. I could spend, and I will spend my life, turning this, this jewel around and appreciating more and more of, of what it means when, when we say that, that Christ gave himself for the ungodly. So here is my attempt to look at some of the things that Mark tells us in his gospel about the death of Jesus Christ. The first thing that we read in verse 21 is that having carried his cross, he is unable to bring it to the destination that he is, is sent to. Uh, of course, this is after a long night of trials, both Jewish and Gentile trials, as Jesus is sent from one house to another house, to uh, the high priest and to Pontius Pilate, and, and then is, is scourged and spat upon, uh, abused and punched. Uh, after he is uh, sentenced to the death by crucifixion by Pontius Pilate, um, then the, the, the sentence immediately is enacted. We're, we're used to, in the West, the court makes a judgment, and then it could be months or years until the sentence takes place. Well, it was immediate in those days. And he's made to carry the instrument of his own death outside of the city to the place of his execution. But being weary from being awake, from being abused, from being punched and scourged all night long, he collapses. He falls down. We see that the Romans that are bringing him to his place of crucifixion, verse 21 says, they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. Jesus is so physically worn out at this point that he cannot do it. And so someone else is recruited to do it for him. It was part of Roman law that a Roman soldier could compel any Jew to carry anything for up to one mile. If he says, here, you have to take this, they have to walk and carry it for a mile. You remember where Jesus says that, that if someone says, compels you to go a mile, he suggests that perhaps you even go a second mile. This is that law. The Romans, if they say, hey, you, carry this, you have to. And so as Jesus' body begins to give out, this man, Simon the Cyrene, is recruited to do it. He's not from Jerusalem. Of course, the city of Jerusalem was filled with pilgrims at this time. Uh, loads of people from all over the place were coming uh, to celebrate Passover. Um, Cyrene uh, likely means that he comes from North Africa, from the town of, uh, of Cyrene, or Cyrenius. And he would have come, perhaps all the way from North Africa, to come to have Passover in Jerusalem. He's there on, on the Passover day, ready to, to eat the Passover meal together with his family or friends. And then, as he's perhaps just walking to the temple, or Pat going to a friend's house, he is compelled to stop what he's doing and to pick up the cross of this condemned criminal who doesn't have the strength to carry it himself. How would he have felt? He would have surely felt resentful, as any Jewish person would have felt resentful in the country where he came from, being told what he has to carry by our, um, foreign oppressors, would have resented that. Um, also, would have felt humiliated. Because there, you remember, he's just a passerby. There's many passersby. The city is packed. And he would have had to carry the cross outside of the city, past all of these people. And every single one of those people would have looked to him and said, that man's a criminal. Look at that criminal. He is guilty of something deserving of death. And as he walked, carrying that, he knows he'd be identified as the guilty one. When he wasn't guilty, he was just on his way to celebrate Passover. He traveled, he's a pilgrim. It would have been very frustrating because he would have been rendered 
ceremonially unclean by doing this. If you're familiar at all with the Old Testament, or even uh, in the Gospel accounts, we see that the, the, the Jewish people had a, a big emphasis upon cleanliness, and especially ceremonial uncleanliness. That there's certain things that could, you could do or could happen to you that would make you unclean. Unable to go into the temple, unable to participate in corporate worship, unable to celebrate feasts like Passover. And so he travels, perhaps all the way from North Africa, into the city of Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And now, these unclean Romans are telling him that he needs to carry this uh, bloody cross, and it's going to make, render him ceremonially unclean, which means that he cannot celebrate the Passover as he was planning. So he is excluded from Passover because of his uncleanliness, he is ashamed because he looks guilty when he's not. But I think it's worthwhile to pause for, for just a moment. We have several more verses to get through. But, but to consider this man, Simon, there is an indication. I can't prove it, but that Simon eventually becomes a Christian. The, the reason why is, well, his name is listed, where many times we see in the Gospel of Mark, Nameless person after nameless person. But occasionally, names are listed. Because the early Christian community, the, the, the Christians of the first century, would have known the person. And so the name is included. The, the sons are included. Uh, we also see in the, right, the, the letters of Paul, he addresses what could be some of his sons. So I'm not the only one convinced that, that he could have been a, a Christian. But as we consider this, let's just imagine, let, let's say there's the evidence that points us towards believing that Simon eventually became a Christian. Imagine as Simon would tell his sons, we have their names there, Alexander and Rufus, talking to his sons, Alexander and Rufus, about that time. Imagine as he would, would come to church on a Sunday morning. Uh, not in a room like this, but a community of people gathered in, in homes or whatever. But they gather together and, and they, they want to hear that story. And he talk about how he, he met Jesus. And he'd say, you know, I, I thought that I was completely innocent. And I hated the fact that all these people were watching me and looking at me. And they thought that I was guilty. But little did I know that Jesus was the truly innocent one. And that he not only was looked at as guilty, but, but upon the cross, he became guilty. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that he who knew no sin became sin for us. Or maybe telling Rufus or, or Alexander, you know, I made sure that I was ceremonially clean. I did all the, the ritual washings. I washed my hands and my garments to make sure that I was clean so that I could perform my religious duty. But through contact with this man, I became unclean. And I was unable to have Passover that year. But little did I know at that point that it's, it's through contact with this man, Jesus Christ, that I, can be, that I have become clean in the sight of God. That he has made me clean. And so I just, in my mind's eye, just imagine him speaking to Rufus and Alexander, speaking to his local church about this encounter that he had with Jesus, where he was looked at as guilty, and he was looked at as unclean, but through Jesus, has been made justified, and he has made him clean.